and has been meeting with a host of state officials. Earlier this afternoon, she addressed the people of the Commonwealth. We stand ready in Massachusetts to provide whatever assistance necessary as they obviously deal with um, a situation of enormity to the degree that we can't um, even begin to comprehend. Even when you see the pictures on TV, I'm not sure we can uh, comprehend everything they're going through today. There was uh, one request to the National Guard uh, to send some um, F-15s into New York airspace. That was, um, we honored that request. Uh, I believe there is a search and rescue team out of Beverly um, that was also uh, requested to be activated. We have done that. Uh, each of the individuals here has relationships and established communication plans with their uh, counterparts in New York. And we are prepared, and I've expressed uh, personally to Governor Pataki's staff that we will send whatever support is necessary. We also are cognizant of the fact uh, that uh, Massachusetts hospitals may also um, be required uh, to help deal with the tragedy down there. Uh, we're prepared on that front as well. And I want families in Massachusetts to know that all the individuals gathered here with me are working diligently every uh, single hour of the day today and will continue to to protect their safety. We have uh, identified areas of vulnerability. Uh, those are long-standing plans that were in place and we're taking whatever steps are called for to protect the citizens and families of the Commonwealth. Now, the governor mentioned two ways that the state of Massachusetts is helping the situation down in New York. The governor sent two F-15s out of Otis Air Force Base to fly into New York airspace where they remain at this particular time. FEMA, the Federal Emergency <laughs> Management Association, requested that the search and rescue team come down from Beverly. It is one of 27 federal teams in the country. It is a self-contained unit with 64 members, including search dogs, sound tracking materials, as well as structural engineers. They are all on their way to New York to help with the search and rescue operations down at the World Trade Center. Again, the governor wants everyone to remain calm. Most importantly, the state of Massachusetts is maintaining a state of preparedness. There is no specific threat against any citizens or structures here in the Bay State. At this particular time, a level two state of alert is in effect here in Massachusetts. That is meaning that people should remain vigilant, stay on top of what's happening, and stay home at this particular hour. Joe, that's it from Framingham at this particular time. We hope to hear from the governor hopefully within the next hour. All right, when we do, Josh, we, of course, will go back to you. Now, Boston police deploy, deployed officers to all high-profile areas in the city today. Some 1,500 state-owned buildings around the state were locked and secured with extra police today. All federal buildings in the state were closed today. Amtrak canceled service between Boston and Washington for the remainder of the day. Barricades were set up around the USS Constitution, and service at Logan Airport, we're told, it would be closed at least until noon tomorrow. One of the buildings that was evacuated today was the Prudential Center, and that's where we find Robin Hamilton. Robin? Good afternoon, Joe. That's exactly right, because some of the city's most prominent buildings are in this area, namely, as you mentioned, the Prudential Center, as well as the John Hancock buildings. There has been a heightened sense of tension around this area. Earlier this morning, the Prudential Center had a voluntary evacuation. Most employees here did leave around 9 o'clock. At 10.30, they issued a voluntary, a rather a mandatory closure of that building. The same followed for the John Hancock buildings. Six buildings total evacuated, 12,000 employees. Since then, the streets, the sidewalks have pretty much remained very quiet. All of this very heavy resting on people's hearts and minds. We had a chance to talk to several people earlier today, and this is what they had to say. So that was kind of shocking, and it was we kind of thought it was an accident. Uh, but then we heard about the second plane, and then terrorists came in, and then that initially scared you. But uh, never thought until they talked about the Pentagon that we were in danger. Just hearing that it, the, the plane originated from Boston is, is making me nervous, you know what I mean? Which means that if there's anyone left here still in Boston, I mean, they're still running around, you know? So that, that kind of makes me concerned. Now, coming back out here alive, you can take a look and see that the flag has been lowered to half staff. We did notice that there was a police presence out here a little bit earlier uh, this morning. Uh, we talked to some members inside the Prudential Center. They didn't want to talk to us. Apparently, this is a very tense situation, though they are urging everyone to remain calm. All they would tell us, though, is that they are working in conjunction with the police to make sure that this area is secure. Back to you, Joe. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Robin. I'm 
uh, being brought some uh, late information here that I'll share with you at this moment. Uh, it comes out of uh, Hanscom Air Force Base in Bedford. We're being told there that the Office of Special Investigations at Hanscom Air Force Base, at the uh, just out in Bedford, has confirmed that an all-points bulletin, an APB, has been put out for two cars, each containing at least one Middle Eastern male, one uh, Middle Eastern appearing male. Uh, this uh, information has been confirmed by the Air Force as well as the uh, Bedford, po Bedford Police. Again, uh, the Office of Special Investigation has an all-points bulletin out uh, for two cars, each containing uh, a man of Middle Eastern descent. We will continue to follow that. Also, we wanted to let you know that a Worcester Limousine Company is offering free rides uh, to any medical personnel from the Boston area who'd like to go to New York to help with the injured. The company says they still have room for 30 people and they are encouraging any doctors, nurses, or specialists to join them on their trip to New York. They'll be leaving Boston at 6 o'clock tonight and will be given a police escort all the way to New York City. You can see the phone number there on the screen, 508-753-7008. We, of course, will continue to follow these developments as well as how they affect Boston, Massachusetts, and New England throughout the day, tonight, and tomorrow. We ask that you stay with us. For now, we go back to the network and Dan Rather. It's not returned to Washington, so far as anybody can figure out, and as far as we can determine, that he went instead to Barksdale Air Force Base outside Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, there he videotaped an, another statement to the American people, somewhat longer, among other things, calling for the prayers of those for those families most directly affected and then uh, unannounced he uh, took off and went to destination unknown but it became known that that was off at Air Force Base in Nebraska now as uh, Senator Chuck Hagel explained to Bob Schieffer not long ago while these pictures were being shown on American television the decision was being made to take President Bush to that air base in Nebraska because said Senator Hagel it is among the most secure US military bases in the world it was formerly the headquarters for SAC the strategic air command which featured B-52s in the air at all times as part of our defense in the Cold War so the president was taken there for a briefing. Obviously, there have been some uh, discussions about the symbolism of the President of the United States being kept out uh, of the White House. And, you know, was it a good idea for him to return immediately? The decision obviously was made no. And now uh, a decision in progress, if indeed it has not already been made, of where the President is to, to spend this night. I want to go to Bob Orr uh, in our Washington Bureau as well as you look at uh, videotape of what happened here in Manhattan earlier this morning. Bob? federal authorities have to figure out uh, over the coming days is how did this attack take place? I mean, how was it that hijackers managed to penetrate the nation's aviation system all at the same time at three of the busiest airports? Now, it's very important to know as we watch the pictures what exactly happened today in terms of a timeline. Uh, just before 7 o'clock at Boston and at Newark and at Washington's Dulles, uh, some number of hijackers, it's not clear yet how many, made their way through the normal checkpoints, boarded planes like everybody else, and then we know what happened from there. The timing is important. These are probably among the busiest times for any of the nation's airports. Uh, that is among the most vulnerable points during the day. The other thing to remember here is that all of these attacks apparently were suicide attacks. And it's always been a fear of the U.S. aviation experts that this is the very kind of attack that we are most vulnerable for. Very, very hard to stop. I mean, a lot of the system is built on the belief that most people want to remain alive. If you have somebody who is perfectly willing to die in the attack, then, then you mean you have to catch him at that magnetometer, that screening place where they look for guns. We don't know how the hijackers commandeered these airplanes. Perhaps the cockpit voice tapes, if they can be found, will shed some light on that. But they may have used guns, maybe they didn't use guns. But if there were enough of them, it's a conceivable theory that these pilots may have been uh, overpowered, and you don't need a gun to do that. And once somebody has control of that airplane, it's going to go where uh, whoever has their hands on the control puts it. It's, it's a real dilemma, but whoever planned this attack chose some of the busiest airports at one of the busiest times of the day and also I think it's worth noting chose two of the largest symbols of the US aviation system United Airlines the biggest airline in America and American Airlines the second biggest and I think that all of this came together at a point in time where the system just could not handle it Dan Bob Orr true or untrue that uh, major airlines are, are supposed to keep the cockpit door locked 
uh, during flight. Frankly, I fly a fair amount, and it's been a long time since I've seen one of those locked doors. Yes, but I, it, I, is I that supposed everybody. to be the rule? It is the rule, and it's a weakness in the system. Uh, oftentimes, there are things in the system where the rule is not followed to the letter. We don't know, and I think it's worth reminding people that we don't know, Dan, how these hijackers made their way into the cockpit. But uh, perhaps the door was unlocked, perhaps there were enough uh, hijackers on the plane that simply force was used. But it is something that I assure you the FAA is already going back to look at. There have been a number of GAO investigations, a number of oversight hearings on Capitol Hill, looking at these very issues. What do we do at the screening points to make sure that we have maximum security? And then what do we do in the air to give the pilots the best chance to save the plane and the people on board? Obviously today, something went very, very wrong. It was a very deliberate attack, uh, attack and one that was obviously well planned, Dan. Bob Orr, as we continue to show pictures of what happened in lower Manhattan, during and after the collapse of the World Trade Center and occasionally show pictures of the Pentagon being hit by a hijacked plane. Let's talk about what are supposed to be security things on the ground. No one wants to be flip uh, about this situation, but anybody who travels knows that what was supposed to be security systems on the ground at most, if not all airports, number one, are manned by people who are outsourced contractors and who are paid, if not minimum wage, something near minimum wage. Uh, I've heard airline travelers talk about this for years. Has anybody in Washington been aware of, uh, you know, it's hard to get a absolute first class security system when it's low pay and nobody really seems to be paying attention. Quite frankly, at your average airport, there's been a sense, rightly or wrongly, that somebody who scored in the high 90s on a dumb test could get through what passes for security at most of our airports. Unfortunately, you're right, Dan. It's, uh, it's been long known to be the weak point in the system. We have these metal detectors that are set up at the security screening points, and they're only as good as the people monitoring the equipment. Uh, in most cases, there's a split jurisdiction. Usually it's the airport authority that's in charge of security until you get into the gate area. And then once you talk about the gate area, uh, it's up to the individual airlines to secure that tarmac spot and their airplanes. Now, this is something else that uh, I don't know whether we've talked about it through the day, but something else that, that will be looked at. There is also, I suppose, a possibility this could be some kind of inside job. This could have been somebody working on uh, the tarmac at Boston and also at Dulles and also at Newark. I don't know that, but a couple of points are, are worth making here. When tests have been done on these x-ray checkpoints, many, many times the uh, testers are able to get weapons through those points, explosives, and guns. It usually leads to an uproar on Capitol Hill. It leads to all kinds of threats from Congress that a crackdown is about to happen, and it just simply hasn't happened. This is a system built largely on trust, built largely on the fact that we haven't had an episode certainly like this. We haven't even had a hijacking in this country for quite some time. Uh, the emphasis is on keeping guns off of airplanes. And the thought is if you keep a gun off an airplane, you'll stay away from the hijacking uh, regime. But if you have, and I repeat, Dan, if you have a suicide terrorist willing to die in the attack, it could be he could walk right through a manned checkpoint, he could fit the profile of all the normal passengers, and through some kind of means on the plane, take control of that airliner. A number of things, I think it's safe to say, went wrong today. And it was proven once again today that the system is not very good. And today it failed terribly. Bob Orr in Washington with me here at CBS News World Headquarters in New York as you continue to see photographs, actual pictures of what happened here in New York this morning at the World Trade Center. Fuad Ajami, distinguished professor at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Fuad Ajami, let's talk for a moment about the reaction. You travel the world as much as anybody I know. Mm -hmm. True or untrue that fairly recently when U.S. intelligence said well, we have some indication that some terrorists are up to something. The U.S. Uh, fleet in the Mediterranean was put to sea. U.S. Marines training in Jordan uh, saddled up and were told to get out of there very quickly because we have a break coming sure. up. What's the effect of this on, in terms, in geopolitical terms around the world? Well, we stand sentry. That really is the image. We stand sentry in a world that in many ways depends on, on us and resents us at the same time. That is the inescapable dilemma of American power at this time. We stand sentry. We guard the sea lanes of the Persian Gulf. We are dominant there. We keep the oil flowing. We maintain the security of Western Europe. And then 
there is all these attacks and all these challenges to this power. You are watching continuing CBS News coverage of the attack on America. Joe Shortsleeve now in the Channel 4 newsroom. I want to bring you up to date on something we just learned from the FBI with regards to these two, with regards to these terrorist attacks across the country today. The FBI has now put out a nationwide APB all points bulletin for a white Chevy van with.